Okay, this is a video I feel like I really need to make, and it's establishing what factors are important when evaluating how good a respirator is for personal protection. So, in this video I want to go from probably the best to the least useful factors, and obviously the most important factor with a respirator is that it keeps you alive in a chemical weapons attack or a biological threat or whatever. The fact that the respirator does its job and protects your respiratory organs and it protects your eyes and everything else. For, this is going to be for full face respirators this entire video. But a full face respirator, obviously, its job is to protect your eyes and protect your face and protect your lungs and everything like that. If a full face respirator can't do that, it's useless. So, the reason I'm doing this video is because I've had lots of weird comments recently where people have been saying stuff like, yeah, but this respirator looks cool. Therefore, even if it's not the best at protecting you, it doesn't matter. Which is like literally one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. The job of a respirator is to protect you. That should be a really simple point to understand. Lots of other factors come as secondary, you know, tertiary sort of um, factors in terms of after protection other features they have. So, yep, what's the most important fact of a respirator? That it protects you. If I put a mask like this on, The most important thing is it will make an airtight seal and actually protect me. So, pretty much any well-made mask will win on the protection factor. However, the issue is with a lot of respirators, the more functions you add to them, such as speech diaphragms, drinking tubes, you know, all that sort of stuff, the more that can potentially go wrong with them because there's more weak points in the mask. Now, like with a lot of things like this, a mask is only as strong as its weakest component. If you have a very easy to break voice diaphragm, and if that breaks and lets in gas and it kills you, that's obviously the weakest part of the mask. It doesn't matter how thick the rubber of the actual mask is, how good the valves are. If you had a voice diaphragm on the mask that's paper thin and made of a very weak material, that's the weak point of your mask. So, number one, as said, the most important factor on a respirator is its ability to protect your lungs and your eyes and everything. So, number one, the number one factor is protection. If the respirator can't protect you, it's useless. So, I think from now on, any time somebody's talking about a respirator, the most important factor of any of them is will it protect you? And I don't think anybody can logically argue any reason why. You know, a respirator that won't protect you, that you'll die, but it's got a nice speech diaphragm, is a good feature. It's really not. So, yeah, number one. Will a respirator protect you? If a respirator can protect you, it's a good respirator as a start with, but obviously there can be better respirators if they have additional features. So, what is my second most important feature? I would say compatibility with 40mm NATO filters, simply because this is the standard you know, filter around at the moment. Now, I know things like the GSR and M50 are using proprietary filters with the bayonet system, which is kind of a cool idea, but unless lots of masks start adopting that as the standard and there's filter interchangeability, that's not going to be um, a real big plus for me because it you know, stops the mask being compatible with lots of other nations' equipment and the whole point of standardisation with filters is like standardisation with ammo. It means that you and your allies can share a pool of um, working filters and if you're in NATO, for example, it doesn't matter if you're American, British, French, German, you know, whatever, you can all use each other's filters, they're all made to the same standard and will fit all of your masks. That's good standardization. So, secondly, most important factor after personal protection from the uh, threats is the ability to take common filters. Now, this, I know this is only a particular one for the video, but the idea being that I could get a filter like this and I could screw it into any of these masks so I don't have to worry, it's easy to find filters for it. Obviously a mask is only going to work as well as the filter on it, so it's important that it's easy to find filters for the mask and that they work with it. Now, for industrial masks, obviously if you were going down this route, yeah, 3M masks are fine, it's very easy to find 3M filters or 3M compatible filters for not too much money, and 3M are well known for making good masks, so I don't think that really matters in that sense, but for a military mask it has to be 40mm NATO or 40mm standardised. Sunrise, if you don't know, because a few people have expressed sort of concerns about not getting this, it's masks that are able to take both GOSS and NATO filters. So the examples of those are Israeli and Chinese masks. This being a Chinese TF1, um, standardized is even better than NATO or GOSS because it's compatible with both. But if you can't have that, go with NATO because that's there's a lot. It's at least in the West, it's a lot easier to find safe NATO filters than it is to find 
you know, in-date, safe, working Russian filters. So make sure you always go for 40mm NATO or 40mm standardised for the most parts of the world. Right, the next factor we're going to look at is comfort. How comfortable is it to wear the mask? Now, this is the issue when you have a mask like a GP5 style one, an SHM hood. They're not the most comfortable mask in the world. They're, not, they're definitely by far not the least comfortable, but... Lots of people don't find these masks that comfortable to wear. However, I would say if you are wearing a SHM style hood mask and it's pretty much in your size but just slightly bigger so it's got a bit of um, rubber flexibility, these aren't actually all that uncomfortable. I find these masks are only really uncomfortable if you've got ones that are slightly too small for you. I mean, that's very good for them stretching and making a really good face seal, which again comes down to protection factor, which is more important than comfort. But if you can have one that sits well on your face and is a bit more flexible, then obviously go for that. Um, some people were asking me, is the Chinese TF1's rubber better than the Soviet GP5's or the SHM series? I don't really think so, but I think it might have a little bit more play in it, which again would make it better in terms of comfort. So. If we're talking about comfortable masks, here's um, my Finnish M61 made by Nokia. Now, I should have adjusted the straps before putting it on, so it seems that they're tightened to different amounts, which is a bit weird, but regardless, the Finnish M61 is really comfortable, but then it has the issue of not being compatible with 40mm filters, which is a big downside. So, it gained some points, and now it's lost some points as far as I'm concerned in this regard. So, the Finnish M61, if this was in 40mm, what a lovely mask this would be. Unfortunately, it's not in 40mm. I know you can put 60 to 40m, you know, converters on it, but I don't really... Um, want to use that as an argument in this video because I'm kind of talking about masks out of the box but of course if you want to modify a mask to suit your needs a bit better that's good but yeah I'd say comfort is the third most important thing simply because if a mask's comfortable you'll be happy wearing it for a longer period if you need to wear it for a longer period to get out of there so obviously as we've said with the filters you've got the first factor the mask must protect you obviously the most important then it's got to have easy to find filters good filters for it so if you need to you can easily switch the filters and stay protected because as I said if you haven't got good fi filters you can't stay protected and then it's got to be comfortable because you're not going to be wanting to wear a mask that's uncomfortable now tied in very close to comfort is weight if you're going to have to be carrying a mask around with you, both in a bag and then on your face, you want it to weigh as little as possible, especially when it goes onto your head. This is one of the problems a lot of the cheek filter masks have and the GSR has. When a mask becomes quite bulky and heavy, um, bulk is another thing that I'll just tie in with weight now. You know, the bulkier it is, the less good it is. The bulkier a mask becomes, you know, the less comfortable it is to wear, the more irritating it is because of those sort of reasons. So. If you're going to, you know, carry a mask with you, obviously, you ideally want it to be light. So it's not a problem when you've either got it in a bag or on your face. And it has to be comfortable. And those factors, you know, tying quite closely together. But, obviously, it makes a lot of sense that, I think, before we even get into speech diaphragms and things like that, you want a mask that's comfortable to carry and wear. Um, you know, if you have to shout a bit louder while wearing a mask for somebody else to hear you, I'd say that's a far less important factor when it comes to actually just staying alive than, um, you know, just simply the ability to be comfortable wearing a mask and easily find filters for it. Okay, our next factor is how good is the field of view? Masks with better field of views are going to make you feel less claustrophobic wearing them, and they're going to make activities easier when you've got the mask on. Obviously, I'm sure everybody would agree, if you can't see as much, if it looks like you're looking through a little cardboard cutout that's a bit far away, that's not going to be as good as a mask where you can see easily and can do all your jobs easily. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Now we're going to move into the things that are convenient for other people. Next I'd say a voice diaphragm. You know, it's important that other people can hear you, but I think it's actually quite low on the list, of, especially of personal protection. I'd rather have a mask that gives me better protection and comfort and maybe have to shout a bit louder at people than one with a very good voice diaphragm. 
obviously a perfect mask in my opinion is going to do all these factors very well and it shouldn't compromise one factor for the other but sadly there aren't many really perfect masks available as much as you know everybody knows I like the S10 and FM12 and CT12 they're not perfect masks there are areas they could be better I don't have an Avon M50 so I can't say if it improves on it I know a lot of people have said the Canadian C4 and American M40 are very good masks I don't own them so I can't weigh up how good they are compared to some of the others but you know how I evaluate masks often is I've got like 70 odd up masks in my collection now some of them are duplicates so I'd say a good 60 something masks I think it's something like 67 last time somebody asked me and I counted up individual masks now the majority of those I have worn apart from ones that are old you know World War 2 ones with asbestos filters that you can't remove but you know the majority of them that I've worn you can come and you know handled and everything else you can come to a good conclusion on how good the mask is simply from how comfortable it is you know how well it would would it protect me what sort of filters does it take how well can other people hear you if you use the voice diaphragm how well can you see out of it you know all those factors I don't have to design masks or whatever to know about these factors because I often see very fallacious arguments where people are saying no you have to actually have had military service to appreciate the good values of a mask or you have to actually be a proper mask designer to be able to weigh in on it. No. By simply owning a lot of masks and, you know, handling them, I can assess a lot of the qualities of them, like rubber quality and everything else. I think in some ways, having a lot of masks in a collection and being able to physically, you know, have a look at them, try them on, everything like that, gives you a better idea of how good some masks are compared to others than if you were just simply issued one mask for military service. As I see, you know, see that argument a lot. You know, why do you think this mask is bad? How are you qualified to say that? Well, I'm only qualified to say it because I've, you know, examined so many masks over the years. And then if I see a mask that I think is not very good, I have a lot of reasons for reference to say, you know, oh, I can think of ten different masks in my collection that are better than this mask, for example. I think that's a much better way of doing it than, you know... It's like if you if you bought your first car and it was a pretty crappy car, but it sort of just did, just about did its job properly, you might be thinking, wow, this is the best car ever. Of course, if you were experienced with driving like 30 different cars, you might start to realise, like, oh, the MPG isn't very good, the handling isn't very good compared to other cars, the acceleration isn't very good, you know, all those factors. But if you had only just used one car, you wouldn't necessarily be aware of that. So I think, you know, there's an amount of experience comes with all these different masks. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but, you know, that's the point I'm getting at is um, be aware the more masks over the years you handle and collect the more valid opinion I think you'll be able to make on a lot of masks so let's put the Israeli one on the M15 right so here we go Israeli M15 pretty good voice diaphragm on this and good field of view as said and these are factors that I think um, you know are very important the next important factor we'll get onto is drinking tube. But here's the thing, a drinking tube has to be done well to be good. Now, an interesting thing, because I've never tried aiming a rifle with this mask, is a lot of people are saying the Israeli drinking tubes, um, the connector is always on the wrong side. It should be on the left side, because it's on the right side, it interferes with a rifle sight picture. Very, very good point. I hadn't even thought of that, because I've not tried really aiming a rifle with this. Uh, the drinking tube is actually quite good for manipulating in and out of your mouth using this bit. It doesn't. I don't find it gets in the way when it's in its normal position, resting position. And I like that you can just simply, you know, bend the rubber to manipulate the straw into your mouth. Good drinking tube design, especially if I had all the connectors for it, which I don't. But in terms of in the actual mask design, it works well. And as I've said, the M17 uh, A1 and A2, despite the fact I don't really like the M17 because it's a cheek filter mask, they at least did a really good job designing the um, drinking tube system with it, even you know with all the other faults of it, so I can't fault it on that. But yeah, obviously you need good vision with a mask, you need a good voice diaphragm so other people can understand you, and you need a good drinking tube system if you're going to go down the drinking tube route. As I'd say, a drinking tube to as a civilian isn't all that important to me. I'd rather have a mask that does lots of other factors well than have a mask that has a poorly implemented drinking system, but some people seem to prioritise that over the actual protective values of a mask and whatever else. Um, so yeah, those are all important factors. Now we have the factor of ease of putting a mask on, and the SHM hood masks easily win this, I think, compared to any other mask I've got. Just simply, you've got the mask on, airtight. So, 
SHM masks are really good at that. As I said, they don't meet some of the other requirements that I'd have for a really good mask, but they do that job very, very well. Now, uh, obviously, if you... Ha I'd, cause I'm saying this is because we're getting quite far down the list now from what makes a very good mask, but with something like these masks, I would say that a mask that's slightly slower to put on but is very good in other aspects is fine as long as you have enough warning to put it on. But if obviously you're using a scenario that you may have very little time to put it on, having a mask in a fast release satchel and then a mask that's very quick to put on beats a lot of other factors. Now, a very important factor, because I'm going to be doing a video on this because you know I don't like the GSR, I actually found internal reports where they, the British government basically in the MOD knew the GSR was bad for aiming a rifle with. And if this is a military mask, because I've mostly been looking at it from a civilian's point of view, but for military use, um, and obviously for prepping sort of use and that sort of thing as well, a rifle, um, a mask must be good for aiming a rifle with or aiming firearms with. Um, that kind of comes in, I guess, to the eye sort of setup part, but because lots of actual military masks that have been adopted before have been notoriously bad for aiming with. Um, it's one of the reasons that the old Soviet SHM is very, very good um, because it's an optical mask for looking straight forward and looking down sights with and scopes. It's literally one of the best masks ever made, in my opinion, out, especially out of the ones I've got in my collection for actually aiming with. Um, despite, you know, how clunky it might be in other areas, at least when they made a mask for snipers and artillery crews, they knew which factor was important for them, being able to see very clearly straight ahead and look through scopes and optics, and they made a mask that did that very well. So that's obviously a very important factor if you were making a mask for military use. Your soldiers need to be able to aim a rifle with it. It's no good saying, oh, maybe they can have um, red dots, um, you know, like laser sights on their gun, and then they can actually aim the laser sight by hip firing the gun. That's kind of working around an issue, isn't it? A mask should let you shoulder a rifle well and aim the rifle well. You don't want a big clunky filter sticking out the side that's going to block um, shooting the gun. And I'll get onto this when I do my GSR video where I actually post some of the MOD sources for the information I've got. But, you know, having a filter that's meant to be always on the side you aim with even if you can twist the filter back, somebody was telling me that it will actually knock the safety on an L85 if you're doing that, so that's not a good filter design. I was reading on you know forums where a lot of squaddies were actually saying they'd rather just, even if it, they're not allowed to do it, if they were in combat and they had the mask on, they'd rather just take the right side filter off because you can still breathe through the left side and GSR will block the air intake on the right side. They would rather do all that. Um, you know, and actually be able to shoot the enemy and not be killed themselves, then no, you're meant to use a mask with two filters because we say so. So, um, anyway, I think that's pretty much the video summed up. And as I was saying, the mask is only as good as its weakest part. If you have a mask, if you had two masks and they're very similar, but one mask had a really weak point that could potentially break very easily, and then you would be exposed and the mask becomes useless, because obviously if you think how deadly nerve agents are and things like that, you're going to die very quickly if you're exposed to it, even if there's a pinprick hole in the mask, like some of the GSRs had, which we'll get onto in the video when I do that. Um, that's obviously going to totally invalidate the mask, and it makes the mask useless. So, what we are getting at here is that personal protection is always the most important factor on a respirator. Everything else is like other concerns, and most of my concerns with a respirator be personal protection and things that make the mask easy and comfortable to use, you know. Factors like other people hearing you and needing to drink with the mask on should be very far down your list of concerns, in my opinion. The most important thing is the mask will protect you. You can swap the filters out easily on it and the filters are easy to find for it. And it's comfortable to have on for long periods of time and doesn't make you claustrophobic, you know, and all things like that. So hopefully you would agree with me with my list, even if you place some of the factors in slightly different positions a bit further down the line. But I think we should all agree that a respirator's primary job is to keep you alive in a chemical weapons attack or an industrial disaster or whatever else. And if a mask doesn't do that, in my opinion, it is useless. Because some other people were saying that when I was weighing up on the French M51, and I think I'd actually agree with you. You know, the voice diaphragm was good for a mask in the 1950s, but if it meant that that voice diaphragm would break and you'd die, it's not actually a good mask, is it? So, there we go. What are the most important factors of a respirator? Number one, really, that it actually protects you.